interested. Um, and I just believe most of what we need to know about how to fix schools, uh, and we'll kind of talk about that. I don't think we can fix what's already working perfectly fine uh, uh, to do what it is that they were designed to do. Um, we can learn from young people and we can learn from communities. Uh, and so this book and the research project for which this book is derived is me doing that, talking to young people about what matters to them, uh, what factors really supported their being successful um, in and through college, and what, what sense they make of that. So I want to start here. Is this image familiar to anybody? Okay. How many people have never seen either of these images? Okay, so just take a second, what do you notice? Let's get a few people to speak back to me. What stands out for you? Anybody, you can just jump out there, yeah. Race. Oh, what about it? I just, the first thing that comes to mind is that they're of different races. Okay. And I also think about how that intersects with what they're wearing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. My next question was going to be, well, why is that significant? Yeah. But they have on um, particular messages. Can everybody see this okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if it's too bright. Other things. Yeah. They look pretty glum for kids. And the one kid's like, warily eyeing the other kid. Or like, I don't know what that expression even is, but... If I were going to do a children's fashion shoot, I'd have them smiling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Other thoughts? So there was a, a big controversy around the um, use of monkey um, on the black child's uh, sweatshirt. I had not seen the orange, and I like this contrast. I hadn't seen his, um, I hadn't seen his sweatshirt, and I think it's interesting because he's an he's a expert. You know, the survival expert, and just seeing like this contrast, mm -hmm. um, I think is... Mm -hmm. When, um, yeah, before I say that, go ahead, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, um, as someone who frequently buys clothes for a child who's this age, mm -hmm. um, and I'm remembering the controversy around this, I truly don't believe that the people at H&M thought about this, and the parents of the child also indicated that they didn't, and it makes me think about when you're thinking about black children, the hyper attention that we have to pay to sartorial performance and other forms of bodily performance, um, because like, I never buy, I, for children in my family, I don't buy like cute monkey hats or anything that says monkey on it, even if it's cute, and because I'm hypersensitive about it, which also then sends me into a tailspin of self-contradictory confusion. Because um, it actually shouldn't be that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good, yeah. And it's a big deal because of context and history. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on in. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, when people put together a photo shoot, they're in very intentional, right? What clothes they choose, how you're posing, and then what actually makes it to publication. This has gone past multiple eyes, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of intention. And then someone noticed, um, what's your name? Julian. Julian said that it looked pretty glum. What's interesting, though, is that there is this sort of disdain that I read in the white boy's face as he's sort of looking. And these are pictures that were photographed separately. And, but when they're put together, it's really interesting, the contrast. In some ways, we can make sense and start to interpret maybe what his shirt means, what his uh, posture is, only in relationship to the black image. It's really difficult in some ways to interpret the gravity or uh, significance of these images when they're separated. But to your point, it's gone past lots of eyes, there are lots of folks, and there's a subconsciousness around how it is that we imagine other people, right? Particularly black folks and white folks in this country, there's a way that um, black youth and black people and black men and boys in particular have been imagined, right? And if we look back, this is another pretty recent image. Has anybody seen this one? Yeah. There was a lot of controversy around this one too, right? We're taking off our blackness and we're gonna go ahead and use this dust soap and it's gonna turn us into a whole new white person. <laughs> How do we think that this was okay, right? But there is something in our brains, there are messages that we have internalized over time that would suggest that this is perfectly okay. Well, let's, t let's go back a little further. Nothing is without historical uh, precedent, 
right? So there has been a historical precedent for the ways that blackness has been imagined as dirty, as a sort of thing to be disposed of, to be erased, to be cleaned up. When we think about settler colonialism and what it was when folks kind of came here, dispossessed other folks, and then decided this is what our country is gonna be, there has to be some logic by which we explain and justify a sort of genocide, right? Why doesn't your mama wash your hair with fairy soap? Right? And if we think about this, <clears throat> Again, uh, in this historical context, there's this great book um, that was recently published called uh, Stamp from the Beginning. Has anybody heard of this book? The Definitive History of Racist Ideas. And part of what the author argues, he's a historian, it's about this thick, but it's a great read <laughs> for people like me who don't like to read. Um, I said that, sorry. Um, it's a great read as the scholar talks about the many ways that blackness, the meanings that have been accorded to blackness to, to justify white superiority and then at the same time then black inferiority. Because in some ways to have a, oh please, there are seats here. Please, yeah, 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 no problem. Um, in order for me to justify something as really good, I actually need to have a picture or a logic for why something is really bad. So it's difficult to even create an understanding around whiteness as a sort of uh, value or norm to be achieved without actually also at the same time positioning it in contrast to blackness as something to be disavowed. Right, so we know that the U.S. is sort of built in this history and this legacy of white supremacy, which is anybody in this, the most privileged people in this society are people who wear a series of identities. If you are white, cisgendered, able-bodied, monolingual English speaking, wealthy, male, you are amongst the most privileged people in this society. And in some ways, when we think about being American, uh, Omi and Wynne would say to have a national, American national identity really is to have a racial identity, which is to be white, right? Because the norms and the society um, for which this, uh, I'm sorry, the, the um, values and norms for which this society is established are norms that have been imagined with white folks in mind. So um, in 1776, there was this really famous document that was uh, produced. Anybody know what that document is? <laughs> Oh, just yell it out. <laughs> yes, the declaration, that was not a trick question. <laughs> what, was the, what was the primary economic institution at that same time? Slavery. Slavery. Right? So black folks were not brought here to be citizens. The all men created equal, that was not imagined for black folks, right? Because at that same time, there was a reliance on the labor the bodies of black folks to drive the economic productivity of this country. What's also interesting, if you read a little further down in the Declaration of Independence and they talk about the state sort of being designed at the will of the people and that when the state stops working that the people should resist. I find that to be really interesting. <laughs> That's another conversation for another talk. But the Declaration of Independence invites us to resist when the state is not doing what it's supposed to do. But considering the historical context of white supremacy and the white supremacist sort of nation state, that doesn't necessarily go far enough to ex actually explain the positionality of black youth and black people in this country, particularly in social institutions like schools. Anti-blackness, I find to be a bit more of a precise frame for being able to name um, the sort of pain and suffering that black youth are experiencing in schools all around the country, urban, uh, suburban, rural, and so on. So when I talk about um, and said that there's no need to fix schools because schools are doing what they're supposed to do, we can't have a conversation about improving the education pipeline if we don't understand that the pipeline was actually designed to inferiorize black youth. Right? That requires a radical reimagination of what schools and schooling is. Right? And so we can't fix what's not broken. We actually need to understand it as doing what it's supposed to do and then reimagine something else altogether. So when you think about anti-blackness, 
ways to think about anti-blackness is that it represents an act of disdain for blackness. So we saw in those images that there um, is a market to the masses for a recalibration or reimagining of, of blackness. Let me clean you up with this soap and make you more white. It centers on black suffering. Anti-blackness positions black bodies as disposable. When you think about the ubiquity of extrajudicial killing, right? We can watch black men be murdered on tape and their, their assailants get acquitted. And in our minds, it should conjure some sort of, um, you know, like how does this continue to happen over and over again? How many people have heard that seeing is believing? Right, we've all heard that before. But in this case, it's, it's sort of curious that we can actually see and still believe the, the, the person committing the assault, right? In some ways, that's because we have internalized messages of anti-blackness, and that doesn't mean that we're attempting to be anti-black, but we've internalized messages and not even known it, right? Anti-blackness characterizes blackness as inherently problematic. It underscores the impossibility of black people's humanity. Right? So even um, when we think about, um, I sort of think about white supremacy, part of the logic of white supremacy is sort of centered on control. It's centered on how can I get you to act, be just like me so that I maintain my position and you, play, you sort of play your position, right? Um, we sort of see that play out in certain types of schools and certain types of communities. Not, a, not all communities have no excuse charter schools. Why is that? What do we think about the South Side if we always running to certain communities to open certain types of schools, but we never sort of consider, well, if this school is so good, why isn't it in, uh, on the North Shore, right? Why aren't we considering that? And in, in my work, I study empathy, and, and historically I've done that work by studying white women teachers sort of desires and conceptions of empathy and why it is that they chose to go into education, and they will often say, what well, was a matter of profound social justice for me. I could have been a doctor, but I really just thought, I really want to go teach kids on, you know, on, on whatever side of the city. And my question always is, well, if you've never actually spent any time in that community, how do you know what they need and that you actually have the goods to provide it? And there's really not generally an answer for that, but this is, again, the logics that we've sort of all internalized that have positioned us in a particular way that would then justify certain moves that we make in the name of, let's say, urban education reform. And that sort of brings us here. Oh, I forgot I had this slide. <laughs> so if we're looking even further with anti-blackness, researchers have found that black faces tend to be associated with negativity. The young black men and boys are perceived to be more of a threat than their white counterparts. The young black men and boys are seen typically as older and less innocent than their white counterparts. Does anybody remember in the video of the, um, it was a police officer in a helicopter looking down at Terrence Crutcher, what he said about Terrence Crutcher right before they shot him? He's like, oh, he's that big dude. <laughs> Look at that really big guy. He looks really dangerous. He's all the way up in the helicopter, looking down. And, and part of the justification when someone kills, when these black, when these black men are killed, is this, um, I fear for my life sort of deal. Well, that makes sense if you view them as much larger and much more of a threat than they really are, that, 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 um, that there is evidence to support. And right, this legacy of anti-blackness um, talks about the multiple ways that black men have been constructed as uh, deviant, as animalistic, as bestial, right? So when um, uh, Eve says, I can't get monkey clothes for, my, for my, my nieces and nephews, that's part of a history of black people being, even Michelle Obama, right? First lady was portrayed as a monkey, right? As an animal, as a lesser life form, which then justifies your disposal. Young black men and boys tend to be largely imagined as threatening or dangerous, and they inspire a fear similar to arachnophobia in white perceivers. 
And black boyhood is socially unimagined and unimaginable. There's all of this literature. I think about Ann Arnett Far Ferguson's work. I think about um, James Earl Davis's work, who talks about the ways that black boys tend to be criminalized in school. How schools are, it's not just a school to prison pipeline, but schools as a carceral state. That schools become themselves a prison that is preparing young people for the types of lives that, that they're expected to live later. All right. Now this brings us here, sort of set the stage, and I'm gonna show you a quick video, and we'll have a little conversation. Oh. We opened up for prep because, frankly, in the city of Chicago, young African-American males are in crisis. We've got a 60% high school dropout rate, 2.5% college completion rate. Because frankly, in the city of Chicago, young African-American males are in crisis. We've got a 60% high school dropout rate, 2.5% college completion rate. Many of us, we didn't have much hope for ourselves as far as our future was concerned. I really don't have any thoughts about college. I was just trying to graduate with me. And part of what we have to do here at Urban Prep is change those statistics. We want to increase the number of African-American young men who are earning college degrees in this city and in this country. It means a lot to be here, to be at a school where people care about me, to be somewhere that I know that people want me to succeed. It motivates you to do the things that you think you cannot do, like applying to college. It made me think about college now. I'm very excited to go to college. They are supportive, and I think that's the biggest key in this whole school, is just the support that they have for us. To become a well-rounded person that every prep wants me to become, so I have the tools that I need to succeed in college. We want them to grow up to be exceptional and be real positive contributors to their society. They just offer a vast amount of opportunities for my brothers to just excel. Like going to colleges and universities, like uh, University of Michigan and Stanford. And this summer I'm going to a junior law program at DePaul University. Study a broad program that takes me to South Africa to study engineering, which is one of the most mind-blowing opportunities I've ever had in my entire life. It's tough to be what you don't see. And so we take our jobs as role models for these young men very, very seriously. We want to make sure that our students see examples in men and women who work at Urban Prep of excellence, of exceptionality. The positive role models, the positive people that are around you every day, it puts us in a position to pursue success. They're always complimenting us and they're always giving us advice. Like, they're our own parents pushing me to accomplish greater things that I never thought I could ever do. I'm able to like climb mountains. These teachers really care about my future. Everyone's here to help you in the college counseling area, teachers, staff, and your peers. Urban Prep surrounds me with young men that actually want something out of their lives. Yeah, and Urban Prep, I stay on top of my stuff and bring my friends along with me. It's like we love each other, but we too manly to say it. <laughs> These guys are serious. They're serious about their futures. They're serious about what they're doing. They understand, as our creed says, that they have a responsibility to themselves, to their community, and to their world. And our creed says we are college bound, we're exceptional, not because we say it, but because we work hard at it. I try to represent being exceptional each and every day. They believe the creed, they believe those words, they understand that they're college bound. And our students have done it with our 100% college acceptance rate. For our graduates, that's proof positive that our young men understand that they're going to change the world. Being here at the FBA is changing my life. I'm very excited about my future. Um, I'm shooting for the stars. I want to go to a good college. I want to come back with knowledge to help support my family. I want to become a mechanical engineer. Once I get my degree in engineering, I want to go into law. I will be known for my success. With everything that Urban Prep has provided us, we can accomplish greater things. We don't have to settle for the least. We can shoot for the best. This is what happens when you do. All right. Uh oh, gotta move this back. Take a minute. <clears throat> Think about how that um, video made you feel. How many people watch that video and you're like, sort of warm and fuzzy? 
Anything you noticed? Any words stand out to you? Any ideas? Concepts, yeah. Exceptionalism. Okay. Mm-hmm. We heard that several times, yeah. What else, yeah? College. College. Believe. Believing, uh-huh. Family. I'm sorry? Family. Family, yeah. Love. Love. <laughs> Support. Support. Emails don't stop because I'm here, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. They said, we love each other, but we're too many to say. Interesting, right? Yeah. So if we think about where we started, <clears throat> part of the significance, some, some of us may not have noticed in that picture with the two boys. This is very current, but if, this is what we're talking about when we talk about messages being sent in terms of messages around superiority and dominance and inferiority and um, uh, subjugation, right? He was, the, the white child not only didn't have an animal, well he had an animal on his shirt, but he was positioned as a survival expert. How many people, um, if I had to choose, do I want to be the monkey or do I want to be the survival expert, right? Um, and there are these, again, messages that we're internalizing that sort of suggest to us that to be successful, to get to a certain place in life and you got to do a certain set of, um, you got to follow a certain path and have a certain set of activities that can then, um, be really troubling when we at the same time try to have a conversation around embracing and, in, and organizing schools that really appreciate the full humanity of young people. Because if a young person shows up into my school building not sort of fitting within the paradigm of what I consider to be successful, it's really easy for me to be an oppressive sort of force in that particular school. Right. So part of um, what we see here in an anti-black climate is that this school sort of emerges as a we know how black boys have been positioned. We can um, sort of conjure when we hear the language of urban schools, urban communities. There's a sort of dominant story that we that we sort of uh, there's a schematic reference that we have about Inglewood. Right. And so this school is saying we're going to open this school up in Inglewood and we're going to give you another picture. So part of the tagline is we're changing the narrative. We're recreating how folks think about and see black boys in part because we want black boys to be successful and we are starting this school as an answer to this persistent failure of public schools to serve uh, young black men and boys. And this is, this is the context that Urban Prep is sort of founded. Right. It was also founded as part of the, the uh, Renaissance 2010 initiative to close down all of these schools, again, in particular neighborhoods and reopen those schools uh, in, 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 in this, uh, under the guise of school options. This is when this became really interesting to me when I was finishing my doctoral uh, studies at UIC. I, taught and worked throughout my entire doctoral program. So those of you who are full-time, fully invested in the university, good for you. I don't feel sorry for you when you say life is hard because uh, I was studying at night and working all day. But part of what I did my last year as I wrote my dissertation is that I would substitute teach. And I substitute taught on all parts of the city and it was amazing to me that the north side is an entirely different world. It is like not even Chicago anymore to me. And at the time, Rahm Emanuel was saying, well, we need more school, you know, more uh, time in the school day. And he was saying six and a half hours is just not long enough. But the parents on the north side were like, my kids are doing just fine with a six and a half hour school day. And it was really curious to me again that those white families fairly affluent white families in the same city had this issue with what he identified to be this fix. And if it's not good enough for them, what makes the people think that it's good enough for us over here? Furthermore, if you're a bad teacher eight hours of the day, six hours of the day, you're gonna be awful eight hours of the day. This is gonna elongate your being awful, right? So that's not an answer. And really, furthermore, it's a, it's a band-aid. It's not getting at the structural sort of factors that, that have um, sustained um, the academic vulnerability of these communities. Communities. And part of that, as I'm arguing and thinking about in this work, are the logics that we use to even justify uh, making particular moves, right? So, and then that's me. 
when I taught at the school uh, as the founding math teacher, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So urban preparation, uh, the substance of the book that's here and available for sale after, uh, it depicts the ecology of people, moments, lessons, incidents, and interactions that collectively help determine the journey to and through college. Part of what I wanted to do in this study is to really make sense of um, how young people define the factors that support their success. We have lots of evidence from lots of different researchers across multiple disciplines who talk about what works, right? A lot of uh, really good work has come out of Chicago and CCSR for trying to make some sense of what factors really support um, urban schooling, but not enough work really censors the voices of these young people as they start to identify and nuance the factors that they believe are really um, important. Um, for their uh, academic success. And so part of what led me to want to study this particular group of students um, uh, from Urban Prep is that all we know really is that there's 100% college acceptance. And they've sort of announced it, that and, and boasted that for um, seven or eight years. But what does that actually mean? Right? We, uh, it gets conflated quite a bit with 100% persistence, 100% completion, even 100% enrollment, and that's just not true. None of that data exists, right? <laughs> So the Urban Prep College Persistence Study, uh, my goal, and I co-designed the study with the Chicago grad, Derek Brooms, um, and we wanted to examine the role and function of Urban Prep in its graduates' college persistence to completion. And we also wanted to discern the factors the graduates believe most determine their educational trajectories to and through college. The young man who participated in the study <clears throat> at the time that the study was conducted was in their fourth year of college on track to graduate within the um, first six years of their initial enrollment. And this is sort of the standard um, metric that um, you, uh, the Department of A uses to try to make sense of um, graduation and completion rates. So we also wanted to study the group of young men who started at Urban Prep and graduated four years later. So um, Urban Prep has about a 30%, um, last I checked, a 30% attrition for its students from freshman year to senior year, which is not that different from neighborhood schools. Uh, so we really wanted to study young men who didn't transfer in, but who were there freshman year and graduated four years later. And of the uh, young men we were able to identify from that first graduating class was about 88. Of that 88, we were able to uh, get in contact with and identify about 25 of them who were still enrolled in college on track to graduate. And for the, uh, for the book, uh, uh, in the study, 16 of them, I'm using 16 of their interviews. And so I did a phenomenological uh, sort of interview and we were trying to really get at uh, how these young men sort of experienced the phenomenon of having grown up on the South Side, having attended this particular school at that particular political moment and was now in college four years later. It's sort of this um, look back at your life, sort of Sankofa, look back on the last eight or nine years of schooling, what stands out to you as being really significant to your being successful in college? And not just what stands out, but inviting then the young people into the meaning making process. Why are those factors important to you, right? So it was both a textural and a sort of structural analysis that was really trying to get at the what and the why of the what as these young men are making sense of that. <clears throat> I use a critical race theory counter storytelling approach, which really again starts starts for, um, begins where where I started the talk, which is there are these dominant stories that we see. Even the boys talk about when you hear Inglewood, that's. Inglewood is the, the nine o'clock news when you talk about somebody getting shot. I know this is where, where I'm from, that's how it gets characterized. I know how, black, how people read black bodies, right? And they talk about themselves. Counter storytelling is an invitation for people of color or folks who have experienced oppression to be able to talk back to those stories and offer an alternate perspective, right? And then to string those perspectives together to then explain in, from alternative points of view the ways in which those um, folks experience oppression and sub racial subordination along the intersections of race with gender, with class, with sexuality, and so on. And I, I take a critical race, gender, epistemo epistemological approach to my analysis. And simply what that means is that um, sometimes when we're trained as scholars, the training says, well, your work needs to be neutral. It needs to be completely objective. You need to remove yourself from the research process. Um, 
uh, Chicana feminism and black feminism will say, no, who I am, my identity as a black person, as a person of color, as a person from a particular community is actually really important to my ability to more sharply interpret the phenomena for the very communities from which I emerge. So I don't want to take my subjectivity out of the research process. I actually want to use it as a way to continue to sharpen how I understand the narratives that these young people are presenting. And that's sort of the approach that I take to doing this work. Because in many ways, urban preparation is also my story. It's not about this particular school. I didn't go to that particular school. And I grew up in a different time period. But when I think about what factors really supported my journey, it wasn't just one thing, it was multiple things, and it was the black community was a huge part of it. So even when we talk about um, urban education and urban school reform, we really miss something if we leave the community out of the conversation. Right. So I'm gonna um, spend the rest of the talk sort of giving you some high level, what I, what I identify to be some high level findings around what emerged as the things that really supported these young men are uh, some of the things that really supported their trajectory to and through college. And then I'll sort of, sort of end the talk with a conversation around some of the tensions that emerged, excuse me, in the data as they talked about attending this all boys school on the south side of Chicago. So something that was very apparent to me was uh, these boys were Brazilian, right? And this is like, okay, duh, sort of deal. Um, but folks are really gotten behind this concept of grit. Um, and if you're black in America, you've always had it. <laughs> you actually never had to uh, wonder about if you're gritty, right? Um, because if you live in an anti-black nation state, it rec and you want to think something of yourself, it requires that you oppose, actively oppose um, the messages uh, that you've been internalizing. So part of what I learned in this work is that resilience is not something that we need to create or help cultivating young people in school. They would talk about their communities as, yeah, I experienced violence, yeah, um, there were drugs being sold, but at the very same time, the linguistic resources, the social networks, the cultural competence and knowledge that I acquired having grown up in this community are the very same skills and competencies that I use as I navigated an almost equally treacherous and violent terrain, which is a college campus, as the only black person. Right? It's a different type of violence, but a violence nonetheless. And the type of instinct and knowledge that they garnered on the South Side is the same sort of um, uh, skills and knowledge that they're using as they're navigating um, the college campus. And so they would say, I didn't despite, I didn't uh, succeed despite where I'm from. I actually succeeded because of where I'm from. And that's a, a badge of honor that they sort of, that they wore. Part of what, um, learning from the study also suggested that social and academic supports in a school um, should be considering a young person's resilience as a way to leverage whatever those supports are. So those supports should not come into contrast or attempt to um, sort of discredit or discount the sort of cultural capital and cultural knowledge that young people to bring to school. That it's, it can be really beneficial if we find ways to leverage it. The boys also talk a, a quite a bit about, or the young men, I should say that they were grown by the time I talked to them. Um, they had an expansive community of actors inside and outside of school um, that sort of suggested there was a village of support. There's this African adage, you probably heard of, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, quite literally. They talk about at least half of the 16 young men at some point along their four years um, before they participated in the study, sat out for a semester or more. And they talk about getting back in school in large part relying on networks that they had developed as a part of going to urban prep. Right, so um, part of those networks were not just um, actors in the school, but folks who had came into the school who were really invested in their success. So they talk about the news anchor who they met, who they developed a relationship with, or just the other community person. At the beginning of their freshman year, they have a ceremony where they receive their jackets, and they have all of these black men come. And those black men, a lot of them, in some way, loosely, marginally, stay involved with the school. And these boys build this very um, sort of 
a broad network of support that they rely on quite a bit, which also would include, as someone noted here, Urban Prep is a family. We call each other brothers. So my brother is an important part of my success. So there is this sort of collective uh, efficacy um, that, that the school really works hard to cultivate um, in the young men. And the last piece that stands out to me as I think about um, these young men narratives has to do with the exposures. One of the, the uh, participants said, you know, before going to Urban Prep, I really thought college was a fairy tale. This was not something that was real to me. Sort of similarly, I didn't know this school existed, right? And I grew up on the South Side, five miles away. Right. So I don't know that I necessarily have access to college if I don't have some representation. Even Tim King said I can't be what I don't see. It's such an important part of a young person's development to have models that they can start to pattern themselves after as a way to imagine or develop a, a vision of a future. Right. That's different from what they see in their everyday lives. And they talk about this quite a bit with relationship to adult black men in the building because at the time that these young people uh, were going to urban prep, most of their faculty were black men teachers, uh, especially that freshman and sophomore year. So they talk quite a bit about these ongoing interactions with these adult black men and urban prep was very intentional about the representations of black manhood that they had and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, other thing that I'll say is there were obviously lots of risk factors in the community, um, but Urban Prep, there's a great book called Schooling for Resilience, and it's all about the study of seven single-sex schools for boys of color all around the country, and part of what they talk about is the school being a protective factor and doing all sorts of different things. Amongst them is this sort of racial socialization that happens. So the boys talk so much about all of the different sort of side conversations they were having with these adult black men about what it means to be a black man in America and how it is when you get on the college campus, you might be the only one, but this is how you should be thinking about this, right? Um, and this racial socialization sort of shows up as interesting because as the young men talk about their transitions to college and their persistence in college, they don't talk about being shocked that they were the only one. I remember I went to U of I downstate and I remember stepping on campus and just being like, it's a lot of white people <laughs> here, right? And that was a sort of jarring moment because most of my life I'd only grown up around people of color and black folks. Um, and that can really mess with one's psychology. But they don't talk about that necessarily being the shock for them because again, they had um, had lots of opportunity to be on college campuses and to be and interact with college educated black men that helped sort of develop the, the sort of structuring in their minds for who they could become. The other thing that I'll say about this is the evidence will suggest that urban prep as it relates to these young men's academic preparation leaves a lot to be desired. The average ACC score now, if I'm not mistaken, is still like around a 15. And when I was writing the book, um, they had 0% on track to graduate in four years. Um, uh, Illinois report card tells all your business. Um, but at the same time, these young men have such strong academic self-efficacy. They graduated high school feeling extremely confident that they could leave the South Side and everything that they always knew and was comfortable to the, the community where they um, saw themselves, where they felt valued and an important part of the community, go away to a college campus in Terre Haute, Indiana, or go to Denison, or go to Georgetown, or go to Northwestern, and feel very confident that no matter the academic task, I can be successful. That's really important. So some Somebody pointed out in the video of the believing. That was, an, that was an important sort of push. I talk about in the book, Tim King, when he was trying to found the school, got rejected twice. And on the third time, uh, he had a conversation with a colleague and she said, well, either you believe or you don't. The believing has to be the driving force, right? And part of what that says is there, again, there's this logic that defies the, the present reality that says this is who you can become and I'm using that, that vision of a future to drive how I'm working with you in the, in the now, right? Um, and so it th shows up as really, really important. Okay, so education as a social institution needs to be reimagined as something entirely different. 
This means re-envisioning aims of schooling and segregated communities of color ravaged by decades of neglect. As I get to the end of the book and the end of the study, part of what I'm reflecting on is conversations around fixing the education pipeline again suggests that the pipeline is broken. And I would contend that the pipeline is not really broken if we look at the historical record. And what we need to be thinking about, which I think is a a noble attempt on Urban Prep's part is to create a school, imagine a school that is completely different from what we identify to be uh, sort of the traditional public schooling um, arrangement. All right, this is what they're trying to do. You have a black man who's from Chicago, who goes away to Georgetown, comes back to imagine a school for black boys in a black community that is intentionally for this group of boys that, that are being served. That's important. That's valuable because it's driving how that school is organized and how it's created. Part of the tension that comes up is that you can't heal or respond to anti-blackness using white supremacist logics. Okay, so as they're talking about becoming successful and going to college, there is this sense as I get to the end of the book where I'm thinking about as an education that has identified itself as black uh, and serving black youth and trying to move black youth from the margins of education policy and practice to the center, how it is that you prepare those black youth to subvert the systems of oppression that they are coming out of. Right? Am I teaching you how to fit into a society that doesn't view you as fully human? Or am I teaching you to ask some different questions so you can choose how you want to uh, participate in that society? And this is, not, this is not like brand new. Carter G. Woodson taught us this in the Miseducation, right? Um, when he talks about taking young people to the water and, and teaching them, allowing them to um, fix the world as they see it, to change their conditions as they understand it. So as I start to theorize this concept of becoming decidedly black, there are a number of tensions that I think urban prep, um, as I think about this school and what the school has attempted to do, um, that comes up. So as I pointed out, their significant self-efficacy, these boys think very highly of themselves. They think very highly of their capacity to go away to college and be academically successful. But I question what that even means in terms of their understandings of, of gender and gender performance. Uh, they use the language of successful black man quite a bit as they're describing their, um, their teachers and the school leaders. And as, I, um, you know, as a qualitative researcher, part of your job is to search the silences, right? What aren't they really saying? And as they talk about successful black manhood, they tended to characterize it in a very particular way. Married to a woman, got a couple children, live in certain neighborhoods, right? It's a very sort of standard hegemonic notion of masculinity, manhood and masculinity that then, um, for other young people who don't fit that, makes this, uh, this environment pretty violent and oppressive. When I did this, um, I did this talk in the fall, and there was a gentleman in the audience who was a former principal, and he told me the story of a young man who would come to his office uh, out of the blue, uh, Clifton. Clifton would show up to his office, and he would just sit there and talk to him. And this young man did this for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, he just thought, why do you keep coming to my office <laughs> talking to me randomly? And what he said was, well, you're the only person who sees me. Right? So. He said, I couldn't really believe that. I mean, you're right here. We can't miss you. But he said he followed him around. He said no teachers talked to him. No other students talked to him. Right? He didn't perform his, um, his gender the way that was normal or standard in the school. Right? And so in many ways, his identity was muted. And um, when I was doing some follow-up focus groups with the young men, to sort of um, get there, uh, we call it member checking. We're looking back at the data to say, this is what I'm learning. Does this make sense? How's this driving? Uh, one of the things that they noticed uh, in this particular section was, yeah, if you had a different personality, they characterize it as a personality. If you had a different personality, you know, you really didn't have a voice in the school. Right. Um, so there's this sense around the ways that this school is organized. Elon Dancy calls it brother codes, where there are certain codes of manhood and masculinity that get constructed implicitly. No one says this is what manhood is, but 
even the teachers were forced to wear a shirt and a tie. I mean, I'm wearing one today because I just want to. But I shouldn't have to if I don't want to, right? I should be able to show up as my full self and you not judge me any differently. But there's a certain code and then the students started to police them. So the teachers don't have to do much because once the code is established, the young people will police um, one another. Right. As we um, talk to the young men about well, what made you different from your classmates who didn't go to college? or your classmates who didn't finish, who didn't persist. There was this real discomfort with exceptionalizing. So we talk about the, the language of exceptionality. I remember sitting around the table writing the creed and we wrote, um, we're exceptional not because we say it, but because we work hard at it, right? So we, right there we're identifying very dominant notions of uh, uh, success, you know, meritocracy, colorblindness, it's about what you do, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And while they had real difficulty um, thinking of themselves as different from the young people who are just like them from their communities, at the same time, in the same body, they were able to say, well, I worked really hard and I took advantage of my resources and they just didn't. Mm -hmm. There was no complicated sort of uh, narrative around the structures that sort of aided their success and maybe didn't aid the success of their brothers. There was a very clear um, sort of orientation towards um, success that had to do with what I do really well and me being the sort of the author and finisher of my fate. Uh, and this last piece talks about, again, there is nothing wrong with going to college. There is nothing wrong with a college for all sort of environment. But what comes out in the data that I found to be really interesting, again, was this tension between um, me being forced to go to college and me actually self-determining that college is my, is my pathway. And part of how this comes out is that the boys sort of talk about themselves. Uh, one of the quotes that really um, sticks out in my mind, he says, well, we were sort of caged, well, we wasn't really caged animals, but we kind of felt like we were caged in. We kind of felt like we were a commodity because at, for these young men, cameras were in their school all the time. So there was this, not just a pressure in school, but outside of school, like everybody has to go to college. And so as they start to think about, and even themselves theorize why some of their classmates didn't finish, they start to think about how college wasn't for everybody, but that becomes another layer of marginalization in the school if I say, I don't really actually want to go to college. That I don't think my passions and my gifts and my talents really align immediately with going to a four-year college or university. Well, what space do we have in school for young people then to dream of the futures that they really want? So for these gentlemen, when they got to college, they all talk about the moment where they actually decided, I want to actually stay here and I want to finish. And could it be, I sort of theorize and, and sort of ruminate out loud in the book, could it be that some of the young men got to college because we're assuming that they all have agency. Self-determination or the lack thereof is not a stripping of agency. It is the um, sort of external control, the lack of autonomy with how you expand that agency. So if you think about these young men growing up on the South Side, navigating uh, gangs and violence or whatever else, and they talk about going to college as a way to in some ways escape that, and then they go to high school and they're being told what their future is going to be. They, nobody ever really asked them, well, what do you want to do with the college degree? Or if you go for a particular major, what are the range of things that you want to do? You just got to get accepted because we got to be able to say we got 100 percent of y'all accepted at the end. Right. So and then they get to college and they have to decide, well, what am I going to do here and how am I going to do it? And why is this valuable and beneficial to me? Right. Um, and so then again, that shows up as a, uh, a significant tension uh, in the project. And I'll end here. Until society comes to regard young black men and boys as fully human, as capable of achieving and thriving at the highest levels, we will continue to experience the problem of their academic failure. This failure will not be because they don't already possess the capacity to be academically successful. It will be because of our unwillingness to notice the mechanisms that drastically minimize opportunities for them to achieve at optimal levels. Anybody ever seen this? I remember as an undergrad, uh, you know, it was all about equity and inclusion. Now you're hard pressed to find any university that doesn't have some mission with diversity and inclusion in it. Like everybody's got some, 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 something, some language like that. But my orientation now is justice. What, what are we doing 
to tear the fence down in the first place? Why do I want to be uh, invited to a table that was not even designed with me in mind? It does not consider the differences that I bring to the table, right? Justice is about reconsidering and reconceptualizing the table. And I just want to read really quickly from the book, um, this uh, sort of the conclusion of the opening. More than anything, I hope that this book adds substantive, substantively to conversations about how to expand access to education opportunity for young black men and boys. A commitment to at least reducing or minimizing barriers to education opportunity necessitates an orientation towards justice, not simply creating more diverse or inclusive schooling environments. Attending to justice means having a reasonable command of the historical and political context shaping contemporary public schooling arrangements. This includes knowledge of neoliberalism, the persistent challenges of improving urban schools in black communities, and the political forces that allow unsubstantiated narratives of academic success to endure without concrete evidence of an education institution's pedagogical effectiveness. Justice is questioning the public's pathological preoccupation with and fetishistic consumption of black boys in tidy black blazers, shirts and ties, and the simultaneous exploitation of black youth and families in the communities where these boys are being raised. Justice is insisting on the creation of single sex schools that make explicit commitments to embracing and honoring diverse forms of black manhood and gender performance. Justice requires that we push back against the ways that certain charter schools in black communities become exceptionalized and by default actively underwrite master narratives that characterize traditional public neighborhood high schools as dropout factories. Such stock stories do nothing for reimagining these spaces so that they no longer exist as sites of black pain and suffering while we keep waiting for Superman to save black youth. Justice involves being intentional about allowing young black men and boys to conceive of a future for which they can be proud instead of simply preparing them to talk, dress, and behave in ways palatable to a society that does not see them as fully human. So as I think about this project, while Urban Prep is um, sort of the site, the book and the study is not about Urban Prep itself. Urban Prep is just sort of one institution. There's this larger um, issue around justice in the ways that we think about black folks and black, black kids um, that we start to have a, a mind for all black folks and black communities. Part of what makes Urban Prep exceptional is because they um, rely on narratives of their neighborhood high schools, the Harpers, the Robesons, that are all being closed down. They relied on narratives that these schools are bad places for kids, yeah. right? They can't exist if I don't have that narrative. In the same ways that we can't understand whiteness as something that's good if I don't have a definition or evidence of blackness as something not good, right? And I'll end here. No. Mm -hmm. Has anybody seen this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna read it. So this is an eight-year-old boy <laughs> who is responding to a journal prompt about Christopher Columbus. <laughs> and he says, today, and he's from Chicago, and his name is King. Today was not a good learning day. Blah, blah, blah. I only wanted to hear you not talking. You said something wrong and I can't listen when I hear lies. My mom said that, um, my mom said that the only Christopher we acknowledge is Wallace. <laughs> That's a uh, biggie. Uh, because Columbus didn't find our country, the Indians did. I like to have Columbus Day off, but I want you to not teach lies. That is all. My question for the day is how can white people People teach black history. <laughs> his teacher responds, King, I'm very disappointed in your journal today. And his response is, okay. <laughs> so, first of all, King is my hero because I think King fully represents all of what I found in this study. This okay says, I'm resilient. I know she's coming for me, but I'm resilient. It says, I've had some exposures. I got another story that I've been told that contradicts your lies, right? And he's clearly got some social networks. He got some community of folks who are wrapped around him that he even has the courage to sort of talk back to his teacher like that. I, he just, this is it right here. Thank you.